Welcome again to the City University Graduate Center. I'm Ed Rogowski, the city editor for CUNY TV, and it's my privilege to serve as moderator for this videotape oral history series of the New York City fiscal crisis of the 1970s. As always, our central and key figure is Jack Beagle, union consultant and pension analyst who played a key role during that chapter of our history. And we're joined for this session by another very prominent New Yorker, Herman Badillo, who is now vice chair of the City University Board of Trustees and has had a distinguished career, especially in the private sector, excuse me, in the public sector, as a commissioner in New York City government, uh, as a member of Congress, as the, formerly the borough president of the Bronx. Uh, he was in the Congress of the United States at the time of uh, the New York fiscal crisis uh, and played a key role there. Uh, He's here to talk with us today about that chapter in the city's history. Jack? Um, Herman and I are kind of old comrades in arms, although I'm older. I met him in 65 when he was a new and therefore sparkling borough president. Um, and we were in touch during this gruesome period, now known as the fiscal crisis, capital F, capital C. And Herman uh, was in Congress. Just let me sketch in very quickly the fiscal background. Um, the city had markets closed on it. Uh, in March of 75, with only trickles of paper, it was able to place. In June of 75, the new governor, Hugh Carey, um, established a new structure called the Municipal Assistance Corporation, and they were supposed to create a market uh, for the city short-term and long-term paper since no city can really exist without access to loans. Now, a lot of gruesome steps had to be taken. And so on July 175, the opening of the FY76 budget, 60,000 jobs were eliminated. Um, a fearsome number of jobs. And we had some uh, dramatic events taking place at that time. Um, I just jotted it down to be sure I hadn't forgotten it. There were demonstrations of various kinds uh, taking place. Uh, the firefighters had just withdrawn $10 million from that city bank. Um, and um, apparently there was a slowdown in the sanitation department. And this I find hard to believe, Herman, since I've been a consultant there for years. I couldn't believe there was a slowdown. Um, and um, the police demonstrated at City Hall and stopped traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, they were just paving the way for Mayor Koch to do that in 1980. Um, and so, in Gaelic, one would have said the city was a hegdish. Um, now, while that was going on, there were all kinds of maneuvers being made. Uh, but with no market, the city's retirement systems became the city's banker. Now, this was very paradoxical. Its members were being laid off. Uh, work rules were being eliminated, and at the same time, they were lending, uh, or they were buying worthless city paper. Um, and by this time, we had already bought close to 700 million. 
And um, now in October, there were a number of appeals made to the feds, short-term loans um, on a seasonal basis, guarantees for the issuance of long-term bonds. Um, all of this culminated in October 3075 when President Ford uh, talked about uh, the city, its problems, its travails, and his solutions. The thing that always impressed me about President Ford, Herman, was his detailed knowledge of the city wage structure. I have never yet read of another president who knew that sanitation men earned $15,000 a year, that they had uh, four weeks vacation, etc. I would have expected you to know it because you were one special counsel to that union. But for this to be elevated to the enormous stature of a presidency still boggles what is left of my mind. <laughs> now, president's major contribution I have the text of the speech, was to announce um, a new approach to bankruptcy. It had a constitutional background, and uh, that was the uh, solution. Now, he had a lot of support here. Wall Street Journal practically dedicated each issue to the issue of bankruptcy. There were 44 editorials. Um, and so there was a background. We had some politicians who favored bankruptcy. Howard Samuels, you will remember, uh, who ran for governor advocating bankruptcy. And so that was the background, of course, as we know, there were seasonal loans, but there was also a new Bankruptcy Act uh, that was written. And um, since you are one of the authors, I thought you might want to uh, describe it. Before you do, our budget at that time was around 15, no, 12.5 billion. Our debt service was 2.3 billion. That was about 15.2% of the city budget. Um, Herman, uh, would you take us back to 75, 76, and um, tell us about uh, who wrote the uh, act, its purpose? Were there divers purposes, or was there a single purpose? I'll take you back even earlier. Uh, although I'm impressed that you're older than I am. I didn't think anybody was older than I am. Well, Herman, but, I'm so much older. I don't say wiser, but older, yes. Yeah. But um, you see, uh, this uh, 1973, you may remember, I ran for mayor against A. Bean, and I pointed out during the campaign that we were heading towards a disaster because uh, the city was paying uh, expense items out of the capital budget. And I had been sitting first in the uh, Board of Estimate when that was taking place, and then as a congressman I had seen that taking place. And you, I realized and I pointed out you can't continue doing this uh, without heading towards a crisis. And Beam, uh, who was a CPA as I am and a graduate of uh, City College as, as I am, uh, we have to give credit to the City University, mm -hmm. um, uh, refused to uh, talk about it and uh, wouldn't recognize the existence of it. After being won, I kept pointing this out, when the crisis first came out, I've given you documents, press releases that I issued, in which I pointed out proposals uh, which had to be addressed, but nobody seemed to listen. When Ford came out with his proposal, uh, I became concerned that um, we were in a dangerous situation because the bankruptcy law that applies to cities, which is Chapter 9, and that provides an effect for a reorganization of debt, because a city cannot go into bankruptcy. That is, city cannot sell Brooklyn Bridge or any of its other assets. 
the most a city can do when you go into uh, the courts is to uh, reorganize a debt. The statute as it then existed provided that in order to go into uh, uh, federal court to get the support of the, uh, of the courts and the Chapter 9, you had to get consent to 51% of the creditors. And obviously, that would take forever. And if you could find who the creditors were. So uh, I happened to sit on the Judiciary Committee at that time. And I was on the particular subcommittee that had to do with the bankruptcy law. So I introduced an amendment to the bankruptcy to Chapter 9, a new Chapter 9, which would enable the municipality, any municipality, to go into bankruptcy court without having to get the approval of the creditors, number one. Number two, one of the things that the labor unions were concerned about, and Jack remembers that, as he pointed out, I had been special counsel to the sanitation men's union, was that if you went into bankruptcy court, the labor contracts would come to an end. That would have been the case under the old law. My bill provided that that wouldn't happen. And in addition to that, it gave the courts the power to issue certificate of indebtedness. Uh, that was my uh, bill, and the idea was, in the event the city had to go into uh, bankruptcy court, that it would be possible uh, to resolve the question of the uh, um, reorganization of debt, because the bill also said that the federal judge could not interfere in the day-to-day -day operations of the, of the municipality. And the purpose of going in uh, was merely to reorganize the debt and spread the uh, huge debt that existed over a period of many years. So that bill uh, received the support of uh, the uh, House of Representatives, the Senate, and the labor unions because of the contract. And that bill was signed into law. Uh, but it didn't have to be implemented because in the meantime, uh, the labor movement, as Jack pointed out, was successful in uh, providing the necessary monies to enable the city to get by. But one of the things that uh, we did get some, some minor relief from Washington, not at all like what happened to Mexico. I mean, I can, you know, today, uh, in recent years, the uh, federal government bail out the whole uh, country of Mexico, and 20-some uh, years ago, they wouldn't do half as much or one-tenth as much for New York City, uh, which I think shows something about the change in the nature of this country. But one of the irreducible conditions, because we're on the side of the city university, for getting any kind of assistance from the federal government was that tuition be imposed upon the city university, and we had to agree to that. And it's really uh, the saddest part from my point of view, of the entire fiscal crisis. Um, you know, we made one mistake. Should have had you, <clears throat> the time that Mike O'Neill was here. Um, now, um, clearly, your message or in your bill was not totally understood. Your name from time to time is simply uh, associated with bankruptcy, and I spent half my waking time denying that. But let me. Um, well, it was a change you. in the bankruptcy laws. Yeah. There's no question about it. Um, chapter 9. But the bankruptcy laws, as yeah. we all know, you have a chapter where you have Chapter 7 and you have a reorganization. For cities, because of the fact the city cannot sell its assets, the only thing you could do in bankruptcy court was reorganize mm -hmm. the debt. But, well, before I get to that, um, I thought we um, ought to take a look. It sounded almost like yesterday, as you said. <clears throat> it's an editorial in the news. Um, and um, it talks about an appearance you made. Um, must have been before the Board of Higher Education. Um, so you must have been in training to take over the board, but that's just out of Wojcik. But this says that the congressman <clears throat> uh, heatedly demanded that City University be retained in all its costly glory. Uh, let me skip over that. Um, 
But Dio even seems to relish the thought of the city going bankrupt as though it would be a purifying experience in which New York's debts would be wiped out and um, so on. And then uh, they printed a lengthy letter from you on March 19th, uh, 1976. Um, I thought you uh, might be interested in commenting on that and indicating why the press always misunderstands people like us. They didn't misunderstand. I didn't have support of the Daily News then, and I wasn't surprised by their editorial, and I didn't pay much attention to it because the fact of the, the, the heart of the editorial really again has to do with the City University. Uh, I was uh, uh, trying to keep Oster's Community College open and uh, other community colleges and uh, that uh, uh, because the, the part you didn't quote from the editorial it says, but did you the congressman heatedly demanded that the City University be retained in all its costly glory open admissions, free tuitions, and the entire array of the 18 institutions. I'm proud of that. I'm, I think it was the right thing to do then. And I mentioned before that the saddest thing about it was that because of editorials like the Daily News and the Wall Street Journal, we had to impose tuition on the City University. Uh, my view was City University had nothing to do with the fiscal crisis. We saw it coming all along. And we kept talking about it at the Board of Estimate and everywhere. It was because there were people uh, like Lindsay and Beam who insisted on paying uh, uh, <coughs> for the expense budget uh, out of the capital budget because they didn't want to raise taxes. So to blame or to try to shut down the city university because of that, uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, uh, malfeasance, I thought, of these uh, uh, mayors uh, was outrageous. And that the Daily News did not like. I'm not surprised. Uh, so let's go to the Times. Um, now this was an interesting one, but since uh, Badio hits plan to shut hostas, and that's dated 3.30.76. First I read it 96, but that was wrong. But I'm looking for the... Uh, no, unfortunately, we got the same problem in 97, never mind 96. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we have a clear disaster still at Astos about, uh, about the, but at least we're not talking about shutting it. We're talking about making sure yeah. that the kids who graduate can write in English. I know, but Herman, I'm only interested in the past. You folks live in the present. I'm just interested in history. Um, now, the time. Well, 20 years from now, let's get together again and talk about the. Uh, 20 years from now. <laughs> I mean, if you and I are going to be around 20 years from now. I'll be around. You'll be around. <laughs> well, I tell you, I'm not so sure I'm going to see you, but I'll wave to Listen, you. Listen, I still run around Central Park uh, several miles a day, so. Well, um, the one thing I don't want to do, though, is run off at the mouth. Now, the Times had an interesting editorial on May 7th. Um, and you're familiar with that. Um, they really cite something that I think was partially true. By the way, your thrust was really to restructure debt mm -hmm. and debt service. And that's why I pointed out that... Um, not to cut expense, not to cut the uh, expenses, not to cut or eliminate the city university, and not to uh, fire workers, including the sanitation workers. Uh, Herman, um, I've been on your side uh, for a long time, oh, as long as you sure talk that way, yeah, you know. But we're doing this for history. Uh, uh, we can't, you know, really edify one another since um, both of us are graduates of City College. And how can you beat that? But the Times did point out, um, and this was after Ford signed uh, the new bankruptcy law, um, pointed out that um, you could really not invade debt service since constitutionally it was really tied um, to the real estate 
uh, tax and how much could be levied on that basis. And so there might have been 200 million available, but not 2.3. But what interested me was, I knew where you were coming from, but in the Senate, uh, Jake Gahn uh, took a totally different view and established a different kind of legislative history. He took the same view as the Wall Street Journal, talked about opening union contracts, restructuring pension benefits. Um, they wanted to, he wanted us to eliminate rent control. By the way, just apropos of that, in one collective bargaining session we had in 1976 at the Hilton, Bill Simon was on the other phone, and he put on the table not only uh, eliminating free tuition, raise the subway fare, also said there'd be no approval unless we eliminated rent control. I At that point, it. we got up and we said, we can't negotiate rent control because we didn't write it. And so we had no power over it. But Jake Gahn was coming one way, you were coming another way. How would that have been reconciled? Well, it was reconciled. He lost the uh, provision that was enacted uh, which you, uh, to answer the Times editorial, uh, mm -hmm. Section 82 of the new law allowed the court, as I mentioned earlier, to give certificates of indebtedness so that even though the Times said that you could only use $200 million, uh, in debt service, in fact, the court, if we had gotten to that point, could have given out certificates for up to $2.3 billion. Mm -hmm. I so know. Uh, that was a, uh, one of the successes that we had in the that legislation was, yeah, that, that was passed. That was an intriguing problem. Um, we were not in bankruptcy. We were paying off short-term debt. By the way, our short-term debt, eight and a half billion in terms of 1997 dollars, would have been 24 billion. That was really uh, the magnitude of it. The budget deficit, 2.5 billion in our $97 would have been around $7 billion. Um, and that was really a, an enormous um, kind of burden to carry. We were paying notes uh, short term through the retirement systems were buying the paper. But if we had gone into bankruptcy, who would have bought city paper? Uh, who would have had any assurance of repayment? At least in the retirement systems, we knew that right now the paper was worthless, uh, but that the city as an entity could survive, therefore uh, would repay. By the way, did repay. So the assets we had of nine billion then, it's about 61 billion today. But who would have bought the certificates of indebtedness? Um, the president, meaning Ford, referred to that in his October 30th speech. Who would have bought paper? Well, we didn't go into bankruptcy, but if we had gone, it would have been bought. I mean, we have all, any number of uh, institutions in this country have had a reorganization, and they have been able to come out. So. Uh, I'm sure that it would have been possible to do it. We didn't have to do it, uh, but the point is that it is better to have had the law than the previous law that we had, under which there would have been no recourse at all. And I believe that the fact that I supported this law and brought about the change, that was one of the things that enabled uh, people to move in the direction of trying to resolve it without going into court and without more drastic uh, remedies such as the one you suggested that were being asked for. So I believe that this facilitated the kind of eventual resolution that ultimately came through. As you were pursuing this in the Congress, looking to make this kind of change in the municipal bankruptcy law, as against other interpretations and those who mm -hmm. were less sympathetic, what kind of reaction did you uh, experience in terms of New York City and its problems then? And how do you think that, that would be different, if it would be today? in terms of the rest of the nation responding well, to New York as, and its as woes. The problem was that the attitude in Congress 
Uh, I certainly knew because I was there and I'd known uh, President Ford when he was the uh, majority leader for the Republicans. And I completely understood that they would all be totally unsympathetic. As a matter of fact, then and now, uh, New York City is really not considered part of this country. Mm -hmm. And there's a hostile attitude towards New York City and towards uh, New York City members of Congress. Um, and therefore, we knew that we had a very tough uphill fight to get any kind of support because as far as they were concerned, if we went into, not just into bankruptcy, if we floated out of the, uh, the ocean, they would have been just as happy. So that there, were, there was an effort to have uh, the most severe penalties imposed upon New York City for any kind of help. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, we were very concerned about doing everything possible to even prevent the possibility of more draconian measures being imposed. Um, well, it's fortunate then that um, uh, we found other solutions. And I think what's amazing is that with this enormous overhang of short-term debt, the 800 million in the capital budget, which had to be phased out by 1981, that a coalition um, really uh, spearheaded, I think, by Hugh Carey. Um, I'd like your comment on that in a moment. Um, that we were able to form a coalition of business, labor, um, the banks uh, also. The most unlikely uh, forces really came together in the interests um, of the city. Um, I recall you used to attend um, some of the meetings of the control board. Um, uh, how do you see the combination of forces well, and I was, how I, they came together? Yeah, I was designated by the congressional delegation to uh, attend the meetings. That's how I happened to be there, by the New York congressional delegation. Uh, but I think that Carey was terrific. I mean, I, we're very, we were very lucky that we had Governor Carey as the governor then, because Mayor Beam really refused to face up to the reality of what was going on. Uh, that's why eventually uh, John Sicardi, for practical purposes, took over as the uh, acting mayor of New York. Uh, and Carey uh, not only uh, set up the mechanisms, but he drove the discussions. He, he, fortunately for us also, he had been a member of Congress, and he was very well liked in Congress. So he could go to Washington and talk to the members of Congress and, uh, and uh, talk to President Ford and to the cabinet members, which was very useful because uh, we needed that kind of personality, and he was the kind of forceful personality who really uh, performed best in a crisis. I mean, that's my opinion of Governor Carey is that uh, he got bored when there was no crisis. When there was a crisis, he really came to life and worked uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that without him, it would have been possible to uh, come to the conclusion that we arrived at. I'll say this about Huey. Uh, he was great in a crisis, and if there wasn't one, he created some peccadilloes. <laughs> um, but he's able to thrive and uh, flourish. Um, now, you know, I really shouldn't do this because the purpose of this taping is to get your views, not mine. Uh, but let me venture outside the bounds of uh, appropriate taping. I have to take... Um, very polite issue with you on a beam. Um, and um, somehow, um, history um, should have a much kinder treatment of him. Um, here's a fellow who inherited, by the way, problems that didn't start with John Lindsay. And John Lindsay was not my favorite mayor. Uh, it didn't start with a beam. Uh, for instance, this whole issue of short-term debt, uh, we have traced back 
1940, when it really started, because in no administration could you roll up $8.2 billion in short-term debt. And, um, and so Abe was really like the um, receiver at the end. Um, started in LaGuardia's time uh, and just rolled right on LaGuardia, O'Dwyer, Impelitary, Wagner, etc. Um, and uh, I'd suggest, I, I don't expect you to change your opinion. That's not the easiest thing in the world to accomplish. But I think we ought to take a long-term uh, view and I really dig in and see. And then to make a value judgment. Was that necessarily bad? Lindsay, for instance, not my favorite mayor, I said, caused a sanitation strike, uh, which, by the way, you came in uh, at the end of it in order to save the union a couple of million dollars. Not that I want to get into that. Uh, clearly, look at all the strikes uh, that poor John had. Um, and so, but there was one thing he tried to do was carry on some of the shards, the Great Society programs. Um, and of course, I may have a different view than you. Now that you're in the private sector, you might want to take shots at the public sector. I have great regard for what each may have uh, in his own time has really done. Now, do I have a shot at getting you to take another view of Abe? No, you don't, no, and I'll I tell you why. So. I mean, I, it's not a personal attack on Beam. I just saw him this morning, and he looks terrific, and he's still going strong. But it you is not true. You should look that way at age That's right. I, hope, yeah, I would hope that uh, yeah. both of us would look that, that good when we get well, to his age. How much closer yeah. to Can it I join than this you? group? <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, it is not true that he was the receiver. I mean, I've known Abe for a long, long time. It happens that he is a career civil servant. He was the budget director under Wagner. He knew exactly what was going on for many, many years. And then he became the controller uh, uh, when he ran with Wagner for the last term. And then he was the city controller. So I'm not talking about his being the receiver. I'm talking about a period of 25 years when Abeam was directly in charge of the budget, either as budget director or as controller. And he could see the train coming. And we talked about that during sessions of the Board of Estimate. So it's, it's, not, it's not that, uh, uh, as, as uh, say, uh, Giuliani, who had no record of serving in the public coming in and facing a crisis. He was a part for about 25 years of exactly the budget making process. And therefore, I'm talking history. I mean, I'm not, uh, I have to point out that he was directly involved, not just during the fiscal crisis, but long before that, in many discussions that uh, I was a part of, and many long before I got there, about the problem of the crisis that was being produced, but the attitude uh, seemed to be uh, among a lot of mayors and, and, and uh, budget directors and controllers that somehow uh, we can, uh, this problem we can ignore because it's never going to come to a real crisis. And it did, and, and, and therefore wow. uh, we have to recognize the reality that Beam knew or should have known about this long before the crisis actually came. Well, I just want to take a last shot at this. I have some other questions. Um, one would believe that governors, mayors, etc., budget directors, controllers, uh, really have long-term views. I think I've worked with, um, or I've known every mayor since LaGuardia, and I'm the only one in this room who was present when this city was consolidated in 1898. <laughs> now, against that background, uh, having worked with them, most of it, and I've met extraordinarily able people, 
very able, outstanding folks. I think of a Bob Morgato, who was secretary to Carey. Uh, Hugh Carey, who was really deputy governor, folks like David Axelrod, but I just don't want to muse along. This city had um, a huge recession uh, from the late 60s through the 70s. By the time of the crisis, we had six years still in the trough of a recession. Uh, I'm really doing this, Herman, for the professors here so they will take a long-term view. I say that very seriously. Uh, I don't think we really have explored all the lessons uh, to be learned uh, from the fiscal crisis. But um, since you are a participant um, and an observer and having the profound background uh, you had, um, would you give me a share your judgment uh, of what the uh, unions did? And should they have done uh, what they did? Um, they took nine billion of assets belonging to its members. They invested, by the way, in the case of the teachers, up to 47 and a half percent of their assets. Of course, we got all the enabling legislation. Overall, 32 and a half percent of the assets. Um, and so, um, should they have done it? Um, and uh, was there any other choice for the city but to depend on the unions? Well, they, the city didn't have to depend on the unions, but the unions saved the city. Uh, it was great that they came forward. Other people should have come forward, state, federal government, uh, the bankers. They didn't. Uh, fortunately for the city, the unions did come forward, which was, uh, which was great. Uh, and I think uh, uh, those who look at the history of this will have to say that it was uh, a tremendous and incredible contribution <coughs> that the labor movement was able to take that huge risk with the savings uh, and the pensions of its members, because it was a tremendous risk. But it's a great thing that they did, because after many, many months and, in fact, years of looking for an alternative, that was the only one left available. Uh, you worked with, I think, all the labor leaders, Victor Gottbaum, mm -hmm. right. Barry Feinstein, Al Shanker, um, John Delury, who mm -hmm. certainly knew sure. very uh, well. Um, and um, so your judgment is they played a heavy Absolutely. leadership no, They played role. an indispensable role. Without them, uh, it would have been a, a really worse disaster, but they came to uh, the rescue of the city <coughs> at a time when it was absolutely crucial that somebody do so. So it was, uh, I think, uh, their contribution cannot be overstated. As you look at the, the governance and the budgets of the city in the period since this fiscal crisis, has the lesson been learned well enough? Are things working as they should? No, the lesson, unfortunately, I was going to say, at the end, the tragedy of this whole thing was and is that we still have a fiscal crisis in the sense that we have a fundamentally unbalanced budget. And different mayors have tried to <coughs> cope with it, but still looms on the horizon. So uh, we need to, uh, unfortunately, once the immediate crisis uh, was over, uh, and Koch came in, there was a period of time when everybody acted as if the problem had been solved. And the problem has not been solved. Uh, we still have a city in very serious uh, financial difficulties. Uh, the, uh, the budget, uh, especially now when we get the increases that the labor, the, the workers are going to get in the next few years, uh, all the projections are that the budget will continue to be unbalanced. So, we still need further uh, measures to be taken to ensure that we get a really 
balanced budget and a city that is on a sound fiscal basis. It isn't now. Herman, I can't thank you enough for raising this uh, last issue. Um, first, let me say that um, it all depends on what one means by structural balance, and I don't think there's any real difference of view. Um, one of the cockamamies who uh, used to be at the control board, nice young fellow, uh, now in uh, the realm of academia in Massachusetts, um, came in with a very <laughs> restrictive definition of structural balance where revenues and expenditures will be on an equal plane. Fact is, and I think you touched on it before, we are a country without an urban policy, right. and that didn't start yesterday. That goes back, I would say about the only presidency that did was the New Deal. Um, but here's a city that has five counties, one enormous school district, um, et cetera, et cetera, and absolutely incomparable. Can't be compared to any other city. Chicago, Chicago has no public hospital system. It doesn't have to pay Medicaid, doesn't have to pay public assistance done by some other unit of government. By the way, this is the kind of problem that a, that a university should be looking at. What is really structural balance? And um, the deficits in the out years. I loved it when we discussed it with Mike Blumenthal, who was then Secretary of Treasury. Um, and so there'll always be a deficit in the out years. And uh, let's see, do I have that table? I have a table that shows that each year we project a deficit. And each year, even during uh, the direst period in the Dinkins administration, we've always come up with a surplus. Uh, the current budget director doesn't like the word surplus, it's now called excess revenue. With respect to the increases you talk about now coming online, well, of course, the first two years were done at zero. But now we're talking about a different period, and I appreciate whatever light uh, you shed, and you shed some light on the bankruptcy issue, the fact that the legislation is there, uh, that we didn't have to avail ourselves of it. And of course, I, um, I agree with some of your basic views, especially about the um, role of the labor movement. And I hope you'll see to it that um, some of the professors at the city university begin to discuss political economy and urban economics. Mm. Now that you're vice chair. Mm. Well, I'm trying to get the, uh, some of the people uh, at, in Washington to begin to focus on, uh, on policy other than saying that we should get along as, uh, as racial groups because the basic problem is that uh, we cannot even begin to touch the problems that we have mm -hmm. without the uh, help of, uh, from the federal government, which is not forthcoming. As a matter of fact, the reason that in the last few years I've been involved in the area of education is because I resigned from Congress uh, because I thought Jimmy Carter had promised me in the Oval Room that he was going to help me rebuild the South Bronx. And then after I developed a plan to rebuild it, Jimmy Carter walked away from it. So now he's going around with a hammer and nail trying to fix up individual <laughs> apartments when you could have rebuilt the whole Don't South Bronx and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and all of the uh, slums of America. I don't think we're going to get help on housing. 
Uh, I don't think we're going to get help on jobs, and certainly we see that today with the failure of President Clinton to do anything about uh, what he promised last year to amend the welfare law. The health bill went down the drain, and there's no evidence there's going to be any effort to get it through. The one area where we agree that government has a function is education. And we better do a good job in education because that's the last uh, uh, hope that we have that we'll be able to uh, solve some of the problems that urban centers like New York City have. Let me, on behalf of the Graduate Center and CUNY TV, thank you for joining us to have this extended discussion, particularly about the, uh, the, the spirit of the fiscal crisis. And as we're about to conclude, ask our colleagues, graduate students and faculty, if there's any, a question they would like to put. I can. <laughs> they've, been, they've been sufficiently intimidated by the, the discussion no. to this point. Then we'll just sign off and say thank you again for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Herman. Okay. <laughs> Nice to see you again.